who will be talking about uh, investigating and defending Office 365. Thanks a lot, guys. Good morning. Can everyone hear me in the back? We're good? Yeah. All right, so by a show of hands, this is the only audience participation, I promise. How many of you guys work at a company with Office 365? Okay. Perfect. And how many of you guys have defended or investigated Office 365? Okay, so this should be fun. All right, so today we're going to start with an introduction into Office 365 in practice for investigators. We're going to talk a little bit about the authentication mechanisms as well as the auditing mechanisms that we as defenders and investigators need to be aware of. Then through two case studies, the first, a business email compromise, so financially motivated, and the second, a APT or nation state uh, motivated attacker. We're going to learn about the different TTPs that they have. We're going to learn about how to actually audit and investigate these activities. And along the way, we're going to learn about some interesting little quirks that Microsoft has thrown to us uh, in Office 365. And last but not least, we're going to have some bonus time. Where we're going to talk about some extra ways of access that attackers have uh, demonstrated, as well as some new auditing features that Microsoft is putting in place that I'm pretty excited about. So my name is Doug Beanstock. I work at Mandiant. I'm a principal consultant there. I've been with the company for about four and a half years. I do incident response as well as red teaming there. And in the past 18 months or so, I've developed a very strong love-hate relationship with Office 365. Uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you guys are going to uh, commiserate with me. I also want to give a shout out to Josh Maidley. He's my colleague at Mandiant and my fellow Office 365 compatriot and connoisseur. Uh, Josh couldn't be here for the talk, but a lot of the material on here is courtesy of him, and he's a really great source for information uh, in Office 365 as well. So what exactly is Office 365? A lot of people tend to think it's just the email client, but in reality, it's a suite of applications. So Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint, they're all part of Office 365. And they all, when you, when you have Office 365, this all falls under what Microsoft calls a tenant. So just like you would have your domain on-premise, in Office 365 land, you have your tenant. Now Exchange Online handles the email, obviously, and it's really just Exchange Server in the cloud. And Identity in Office 365 is backed by Azure Active Directory, which again is just Active Directory ported to the cloud. So when we're thinking about authentication, there's two main places or people we can trust for authentication. The first is cloud-based authentication, and this is when authentication is happening directly within Azure Active Directory. This is very simple to set up and easy to maintain. We see most small organizations use this option, but it comes with limitations. If you want multi-factor, you can only use Azure MFA, and there's a lot of different uh, account settings that aren't available to you with this. When we switch to federated authentication, we're actually passing off authentication to a trusted third party. So for example, a lot of larger organizations are gonna do this because they only want authentication to happen on-premise. They're going to use something like Microsoft's Active Directory Federated Services, ADFS, or they may use Ping or Okta. Someone else is doing the authentication for them and for Office 365. This gives us a lot more customization, so we can use third-party MFA providers like RSA and Duo, and we have a lot more options available to us in terms of account configurations. But of course, this is more complex and more expensive to maintain. So how can authentication occur? There's two main mechanisms. The first is modern authentication, and this is what Microsoft recommends, and it's what they really support. Behind the scenes, it's going to use OAuth access tokens. So you'll supply your username and password to the authentication provider. If it succeeds, you're going to get back a token, which you then exchange with the different Office 365 components, like Exchange and SharePoint, to actually access data. This supports advanced security features like MFA. It supports conditional access policies, so you can apply metadata about a client session, like IP address, uh, location and grant or deny access based on it. Our second authentication mechanism is legacy auth. And this is enabled by default in Office 365, and it's supported by a variety of different uh, protocols. Most of this is going to take place with HTTP basic auth, so username and password. We have EWS, PowerShell, POP, IMAP. They all support basic authentication to some degree. And why this is important is because not only is it enabled by default, but it doesn't support multi-factor authentication. And this is often something administrators aren't aware of, and it leaves them vulnerable. So moving on to auditing, there's a lot of different audit logs in Office 365. We're going to concern ourselves with a few. So the unified, the mailbox, and the admin audit log are our core audit log sources. If you're paying Microsoft even more money, you'll get some advanced features like Azure AD sign-in logs, uh, risky sign-in reports, more data. 
As investigators, we're also interested in mail trace, so metadata about messages coming and going. We're interested in the security and compliance center. And the last one I have here is the activities API. If you've ever uh, accessed Microsoft 365 for investigations, you've probably heard of the activities API. I'm not going to talk about it too much. It's basically this top secret, undocumented log source that was really useful to investigators because until recently, it was the only way that we could tell exactly what messages were being accessed by an attacker. But I have it crossed out for a few reasons. It's unsupported, it's undocumented. Microsoft really doesn't like when you use it. Uh, we also found that it can be poisoned, so you can send post requests to it and just insert arbitrary data into this log to corrupt it. And also, there's some really cool new features that Microsoft is pushing out in the next month or so that renders this largely obsolete. So our main log source is the unified audit log. This is where most of the Office 365 components are going to send audit records. So SharePoint, Exchange, OneDrive, Flow, they all send data to the unified audit log. And these records are stored in JSON, and it's searchable via PowerShell, via the search unified audit log commandlet. And we can search on username, IP address, we can search free text, we can search by what Microsoft calls operation. But there are some limitations. So when we're searching, we're limited to 5,000 events at a time, or 50,000 if you do sessioning, which still isn't that much. And each individual audit record is limited to 3,060 characters in length. And what's important about this is the individual components that send events to the unified audit log, they actually don't respect this limitation. So Exchange Online, for example, it's going to send events that are 5,000 characters, and the unified audit log is just going to lop off the last 2,000, which means that we're going to have corrupted data in the unified audit log. And so, for example, if you're ingesting these in Logstash, you're going to have malformed JSON that's probably getting dropped, and you're missing some important information. These events are going to be maintained for 90 days. And it's important also to know that events aren't immediately available. So a login event can take up to 24 hours to actually populate into the unified audit log. And this really is a function on the size of your tenant. We found if you have a small tenant, it could come in a few hours. Large tenant, it'll take the full 24 hours. So these log records come back as JSON. There's a variety of different attribute, attributes. We're really concerned with a few. So creation time, the UTC timestamp of when the event happened. The operation is going to tell us what happened. The workload is going to tell us where it happened, for example, Exchange Online. The user ID is the account that's executing the action, and our client IP address is going to tell us from where this action occurred. So some examples of events, and there's literally hundreds of them. We have user logged in, which is any authentication event to Office 365 as a whole. We have the Exchange new inbox and set inbox role events, which are important for investigating BEC cases. And we have OneDrive file access. There's a whole bunch of other ones you can find online in the Microsoft schema page. So our second audit log is the mailbox audit log. And this is going to record actions taken directly against a single mailbox. It's searchable via another PowerShell commandlet. These records are maintained for 90 days as well. And Microsoft records access according to three different types. So they have admin access when an administrator forces their way into a mailbox. They have delegate access, so when a user, for example, an executive assistant is granted access to the CEO's mailbox. And then there's owner access, when you log in directly with your username and password to your own mailbox. And this is important to know because we can see in this little matrix here that certain actions are only recorded for certain types of access. And again, this brings us back to sort of the golden question that as defenders or investigators were asked, and that's what messages were exposed to the attacker during the compromise. Currently, the mailbox audit log doesn't tell us that. Most attacks happen when an attacker fishes someone, they get their username and password, they log in, and so that means message binds. So when a message is accessed or read, it's not going to be recorded. Our last log source is the admin audit log. And this is recording actions taken by the administrator according to PowerShell commandments. And any admin access, even if it's through the web-based UI, is actually happening with PowerShell. The web UI is just really a fancy PowerShell wrapper. If you've ever seen the errors in the web UI, you, you're probably clued into this. Again, results are audited for 90 days. We have a separate commandlet to search this. And some of these events, though not all, are being sent to the unified audit log. So we know enough now to talk about our first case study, business email compromise. A business email compromise is a really popular type of fraud that is really victimizing a lot of Office 365 uh, customers right now. The FBI estimates it's cost companies over $12 billion in the last 10 years or so. And it's a really commoditized form of attack, where an attacker gains access to a mailbox and then they're going to masquerade either as the CEO or as a vendor or as a supplier with the goal of moving money into their own bank accounts. These attackers tend to follow a set playbook. So we can see on your left that 
Uh, this victim here, they received a document sharing link purportedly from the HR department. We have a uh, attachment here that links to OneDrive. In reality, it's just an image with a hyperlink. The victim is taken to this very convincing phishing page. Let's see if I can make Zoom work. And this looks pretty much identical to the official Microsoft Office 365 sign-in page beside their URL. So if we're investigating this, we can look at the mail trace log and we can use the start historical search commandlet to actually find the metadata, the header information about this message. And we can search on the direction of the message, we can search on the recipient, we can search on the sender, we can also search on some other important header information like the original client IP address. With the caveat that you can only do this if you specify a sender or a receiver. So if you wanted to search for like all of the messages sent by an attacker IP address to your entire tenant, you actually can't do that. You have to iterate over all of the mailboxes individually. You're going to get results back in the CSV format, and it may take several hours for these searches to complete. But eventually you'll get these kind of records that we have here, basically just giving us all of the header information about our malicious messages. So now we're investigating. We know that uh, Joe at victim.org, their account has been compromised. They supplied their credentials to that phishing site. We want to search the unified audit log for actions that the attacker took. So we can use this commandlet to pull back all of those events. And one of the operations that we're interested in is the user logged in operation, telling us about authentications to Office 365. So again, if we zoom in, we can see that we have result status succeeded. But if we look a little bit closer, we can see that there's another attribute in our JSON record called logon error. And it has this very helpful string uh, user strong auth, client auth, and required interrupt, which I have no idea what that means. But after a little bit of Googling, we can see that it means that the login actually failed because the user did not uh, satisfy the multi-factor authentication requirement. So our first lesson that we've learned is don't trust Microsoft when they say something worked. You actually have to read a little bit further. <laughs> and now to better understand a little bit more about this user logged in record, we're going to take a brief detour into Azure world. So. In Azure, which is really where all of these applications live, you have the concept of an application object. So when you create an application, it exists in the tenant where it was created. So for example, Exchange Online exists in like the, the Microsoft Services tenant is what it's called. Whenever you want to consume an application, in your tenant, a service principle is going to be created, which is really just a local copy of that application. And these service principles, they have IDs assigned to them, which are going to be the same across all tenants. So we can use that to actually identify the real application that was being used to access Office 365 by the attacker. We can enumerate all the service principles in our tenant using PowerShell, and then we can map these IDs to their display name. So we actually can see here that the attacker is using Microsoft Office, probably Outlook, to access Exchange Online. And if you're really paying attention and you have really great vision, you'll see that our user agent here doesn't actually match that. Our user agent is for a web browser. And the reason that's happening is because of modern authentication. So if you've ever logged into your Outlook client uh, at your office, you probably noticed that the authentication happens in like a pop-up. That pop-up is actually just, I don't know the real technical term, but I'm going to call it an iframe, but it's browser-based. So that means that when you're logging in, even though you're using Outlook, because it's modern authentication, Unified Audit Log thinks you're coming from a web browser. So it's really important that we understand all the different attributes in our event log records, and we're actually going to map those service principle IDs so that we can understand the real application that the attacker is using. And we're going to sidetrack a little bit further into Azure world to really understand this concept of service principles and the fact that each component in Office 365, so SharePoint, Exchange Online, they're each responsible for authorization themselves, and they're going to use OAuth access tokens. So what this means is if you're accessing an application that, for example, pulls data from SharePoint and Exchange on the same page, a single interactive login is actually going to generate more than one user logged in event. So a really classic example is when an attacker logs into the Office 365 portal, which is basically like the splash page. It has some SharePoint stuff, some mail stuff, some Skype stuff. And a basic tenant, we found that you're actually going to see six user logged in events for a single interaction with the Office 365 portal. And you're going to have the portal accessing Azure AD. You're going to have the shell accessing SharePoint. So again, it's really important to understand the concept of these logins and the service principle IDs so we can be able to tell our management teams that, OK, these six events are actually just one interactive session to the Office 365 portal. So going back to our case study, the attacker tried to log in. Uh, yeah, question? Uh, 
Yeah. But it says unknown application or unknown oh, yeah. application. Are those just unknown service records? So unknown in quotes is actually what Microsoft records. So sometimes they just say, I don't know what this is, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> Um, and then hidden application is what I've put when you can enumerate the service principles in your tenant and sometimes some just don't show up. Uh, and so that's when I say hidden. I'm assuming it's some like background service. So with our case study, the attacker tried to log in using modern auth and they failed because they don't have multi-factor. But what attackers know is that a lot of administrators forget to disable legacy authentication. So the attacker simply switched to a protocol that supports legacy authentication, in this case Exchange Web Services or EWS. They used the freely available GitHub Exchange Services client, and they gained programmatic access to the mailbox without multi-factor authentication. So at this point, the attacker has access to the mailbox. They're going to become familiar with the accounts payable process, the uh, people involved, the different form emails, basically everything they need to know to do their fraud. But before they commit fraud, they're going to want to hide themselves in the environment by creating inbox rules. Generally, there's two that we find. The first is going to match messages with words like fish and hack and move them to the trash. And we want to do this because you know, when Joe's colleague realizes that his account's been hacked and he emails Joe, we don't want Joe to know. So those messages go to the trash. We're also going to hide any legitimate communications from a spoofed vendor and move them to the trash. So when the attacker is pretending to be Acme.com, uh, this victim user, you know, they think they've paid Acme.com. But eventually, the real Acme.com is going to ask Joe, why haven't you paid me? Obviously, the attacker doesn't want that to happen. So he's going to move those messages to the trash. Attackers are also getting smart, and they know that people look in their trash, or investigators look for this. And they'll also create inbox rules to move messages to hidden folders, like the RSS feeds folder, uh, to just random folders that, the, that users don't usually look in. Um, they're really adapting pretty quickly to new techniques to detecting them. So as investigators, we want to search for these inbox rules. We may also already have some network-based indicators, some IP addresses that we know are malicious. And you know, as investigators, we read the documentation, we think, OK, I can do search unified audit log, give it the malicious IP address, and I should get back all events, all audit records that happen from this IP address. Wrong. That's not the case. And the reason is because certain events in the unified audit log really nicely for us append the client's ephemeral port to the IP address. And because the unified audit log does exact string matching on IP addresses instead of substring, we're going to miss a lot of events that are happening because there's plenty of audit log records that append the ephemeral port. So instead, our methodology needs to be, we need to search by operation type. So new inbox rule when one's created, and set inbox rule when one's modified, and manually triage that data to identify the malicious rules. Furthermore, we're going to see on the next slide that when an attacker modifies an event, so we have the set inbox rule record, we see the ephemeral port appended. We also see that there's not really a whole lot of information about the rule that's being modified. We have the condition that was changed, so the from address words condition. And then we have this really helpful identity value, which is the GUID that maps back to the rule. Now, if this rule still exists in the mailbox, you can do some EWS queries to actually find the rule and get the full contents. But if the rule was deleted, perhaps by uh, an overzealous exchange admin or by the user, you are SOL and you're not going to know anything else about the rule. And then on the right, we have the full new inbox rule creation event. So this tells us everything that was created with that rule. And again, we have the IP address with the ephemeral port appended to it. So last but not least, the attacker needs to get paid. They're going to usually spoof a vendor. So if we're spoofing Acme.com, we're going to register a typo squatted domain, acrne.com. Then they're going to use pretty standard mail spoofing techniques to pretend that they are Acme.com. And they follow a pretty set script. They say, hey, um, by the way, our primary bank account is having some issues. Uh, can you please send the money to this new bank account? And by the way, can you please pay us uh, right now for everything you owe us? Thanks. Um, and what we find is a lot of victim organizations aren't doing some email hygiene things like in, uh, enforcing SPF hard fails. And this enables clients to, uh, attackers to spoof messages and to get through. And we find that a lot of organizations tell us, well, if we enabled SPF hard fails or if we you know, did DMARC checking, then you know, all the people we work with, they don't set this up properly. We're not going to be able to do business because you know, we're going to miss all these legitimate emails. And that gives the attackers the window they need to actually perpetrate the fraud. So moving to our next case study, uh, APT35. APT35 is a nation state actor uh, that we attribute to Iran. They have targeted a wide variety of industries across the world. 
looking for information. And they've proven especially adept at infiltrating Office 365 tenants, gathering up lots of information, and making really good use out of it. So our high-level attack summary starts out with a password spray against ADFS. So instead of a brute force attack where we're trying you know, many hundreds of thousands of passwords against some accounts, we're trying one good password guess, uh, winter 2018, anyone? And we're going to try that against all of the accounts that we're aware of. And let me tell you, winter 2018 works every time. Um, so ADFS is our on-premise authentication provider. That's where the password spray happens. I'm going to sort of skip the internal portion, but basically the attacker gained access to the internal network. They were solely focused on the credentials of Exchange Online Administrators. Once they found those credentials, they basically never touched the on-premise network again. They switched to Office 365. They used the tools available to an administrator, and they started hoovering up a lot of information. So ADFS, we already talked about a little bit. It's Microsoft's solution to federated authentication, and we see a lot of large organizations using this when they want authentication for cloud applications to happen on-premise. But the important thing to know is that because authentication is happening on-premise, when a login fails, it's not going to make it past the ADFS server, which means in the unified audit log in Office 365, we won't find any user login fails because Office 365 has no idea that this is happening. So as investigators or defenders, we're going to need to look at the ADFS, ADFS servers themselves. And in a large environment, this may be a farm, so you may have several. And so we need to look at the security event log, just like any other Windows server or desktop. This is where authentications are recorded. And so we're going to need to be aware that a lot of the times the security event log has like a disk size of, I don't know, 100 megabytes. So it's going to roll pretty quickly. And we also need to know as investigators and as defenders that the audit settings for ADFS in their basic configuration are a little bit lacking. Unless you turn on advanced auditing, you're not going to have really useful information like the IP address or the user agent string that's being used for authentication. So some example event log records. On the left is an example of an initial authentication using ADFS. And we can see, I don't know how to move the scroll, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, the first, the operation is different. It's not user logged in. It's this nice, long, helpful string, uh, foreign realm index logon initial auth using ADFS federated token. So pretty long-winded, but it tells us what we need to know, that this login happened with an ADFS token, which uh, is using SAML on the back end, and we know it's the first time. We also have a client instead of a user agent, and the client is CBA in prod. So if anyone can tell me after the talk what CBA in prod means, I will be eternally grateful. I've asked so many people what it means, and no one's given me a straight answer. Um, so I'll give you a gold star if you can tell me definitively. And then on the right, we can see an entry from the security event log of an ADFS server when we have advanced auditing enabled. So it's XML data that gives us all of the information we need to know about this failed login, including the IP address, the user agent string, and the ADFS proxy that handled this request. So eventually the attacker, you know, he conducts this password spray. They got some passwords. They want to log in. Uh, the victim organization in this case, they did something that they thought was pretty cool and which is definitely a good step. They used conditional access policies to deny logins from non-US based IP addresses. Attackers, however, you know, they read the documentation just like we do. They know this is something that people can do. So they simply just register VPS and uh, internet anonymity services that have US based <coughs> points of presence. Problem solved. Then when we were investigating and doing some testing, we saw that these conditional access policies aren't exactly 100% foolproof. And again, the reason comes back to OAuth and to modern authentication. And essentially what happens is when you log into Office 365 with your username and password for the first time, the conditional access policies are triggered and they're validated. After they validate, the client receives back an OAuth access token, which it then exchanges with, exchanges with different components to access data. The interesting thing is that once you have a valid access token, conditional access policies no longer apply. So even if logins are being restricted to the US, once you save that access token programmatically or even you know, in Microsoft Outlook, you can then you know, go to Nigeria, where lots of these BEC guys live. You can go to the Netherlands, and you can access uh, the Office 365 instance without needing to worry about the conditional access policies. So at this point, you know, the attacker, they got internal access into the network. They started moving around laterally. Uh, they were using Mimikatz to harvest credentials. And they really were focused on Exchange Online Admins. They did a lot of reconnaissance in the domain to identify where these guys work out of, what their workstations are. They moved explicitly to their workstations. They dumped credentials. 
And once they got the credentials of the Exchange online admins, they literally did not touch the on-premise network again. They just were not interested in it. They moved instead to Office 365, which is where a lot of the information that a nation state actor that's focusing on espionage might be interested in. And they used the feature called eDiscovery, which to a legitimate administrator is used to you know, maintain legal cases, to archive data. You can search across the entire tenant, not just Exchange Online, for information and archive it in a format that you know, can be saved for legal cases. Uh, it's worth mentioning that there's another feature called Content Search, which allows you to do this as well. It's just without the case management portion. Uh, in this case, the attackers liked eDiscovery um, for whatever reason. So when we do eDiscovery in the admin center, there's a lot of different steps. You have to create a case. You have to start a search. You have to execute the search. You have to download the search. Each of these different operations is recorded in the unified audit log. Well, technically, it's the admin audit log, which then forwards into the unified audit log. So we can see that the attacker created a new e-discovery e search. And their uh, parameters for the search were, was SDTID and PIN. So they were looking for RSA seed files in Office 365. And if any of you guys work at a company that doesn't use email to send RSA seed files to new employees and contractors, then again, you get my gold star. Uh, but for the rest of us, we know this is a reality, and the attackers know this too. So they conducted this search. Uh, we can see some other important information, like the case name. We can also see the GUID of the search. So we need this GUID to correlate to other events that the unified audit log is going to have about this e-discovery search. And importantly, we see that the client IP address is not here. So for whatever reason, these e-discovery search events don't record an IP address. So we actually don't know where the search is coming from. We just know it's malicious because why would anyone else be searching for RSA seed files? So you can also preview events in the search as they're happening. And that's going to render the preview item rendered operation. And I have truncated here because this is an example of one of those events that just has more than 3,060 characters. And we have truncated JSON, malformed JSON. Um, but importantly, we can, have, we can see this object ID attribute, which tells us the actual record in the search that's being previewed. And it follows this format, case name, case name preview, and then the object name. So we can get an idea of what the attacker is looking at. And the attacker can also preview searches that other people created previously, maybe to just you know, see what's interesting in the environment. And then exchange of locations attribute, this is what contributes to this event being truncated because it tells us all the places that this object might exist. And so, for example, if this was like a company-wide email, you're going to get a lot of locations back, uh, and you're not going to have, you know, it's not going to be 3,060 characters. It's going to be like 10,000. So our next operation, search, export, downloaded, right? This is going to be recorded when the attacker initiates an export of the search. They want to download it. But importantly, this indicates that the search download was started, but it wasn't, doesn't tell us if it was finished. It doesn't tell us if it finished successfully. And from our own research, we found that the way that these searches are exported, it uses like a Microsoft Click Once app, if you know what those are. And it's like this custom little thing that helps you download the messages. It's kind of hard to use. Like, it fails all the time for me. Um, so it may have even failed when the attacker tried it. We also, there's no way of knowing the contents of this search unless it still exists and we preview every single item or unless we run the search again. There's just no way to know what existed in that search once it's been completed. And again, we see that the IP address is missing. So we don't know where this was downloaded to. So lastly, our APT35 actors, they found a couple of mailboxes that they were really interested in. It had a lot of confidential information. They really wanted to learn about it. So what they did was they used delegation, which is facilitated via this add mailbox permission operation. And I believe it's the same uh, commandlet or set mailbox commandlet to grant themselves delegate access. And there's three different types of delegate access, full access, send as, and send on behalf. And as attackers, they're really interested in the full access, right? They can access this mailbox just as a regular user would. They can search it. They can also send mail as the uh, user, really of interest to the attacker. And this operation is pretty good. Uh, as it's recorded in the unified audit log, we can see who was given the access, to what account, and what level of delegation. Uh, but again, the client IP address attribute in this record has the ephemeral port appended. So if we were searching by this network indicator, this IP address, we would actually miss this event. So that's it for the case studies. We're now going to talk a little bit about uh, bonus time. So some additional access or alternative access to an Office 365 tenant. So the first is PowerShell. And there's a couple of different PowerShell commandlets that you can use to access Office 365. Chief among them, we have 
uh, the Exchange Online PowerShell, there's Azure Active Directory PowerShell, and then there's also the new Azure Active Directory PowerShell. So the first one, Exchange Online PowerShell, pretty straightforward. It's used to access Exchange Online. And it's, it's pretty good. There's, there's some good controls around it, right? We can disable it for users. Like, why does Joe in the HR department need PowerShell for Office 365? He doesn't. Um, and we can also apply conditional access policies to it. So we could say, you know, only allow Exchange Online PowerShell if it's in the internet. Active, uh, Azure Active Directory PowerShell, however, is not so nice. We cannot apply conditional access policies to it. Um, the documentation says that the Azure Active Directory PowerShell uses the Microsoft Graph, and that's, that's why. Uh, we also can't turn it off. So any user in an Office 365 tenant can actually access Azure Active Directory via PowerShell, even an unlicensed user. So even if you have a user in your tenant and they don't have any apps assigned to them, they don't have a mailbox, but they can log in, they can access Azure Active Directory PowerShell. And what we see attackers using this for is a couple of things. Primarily, they use this for password sprays because they know it can't be turned off. You really can't restrict it unless you're enforcing MFA elsewhere. They're going to use it for password sprays. They're also going to use it to dump the global address book because you can dump the global address book using Azure Active Directory PowerShell in one line once you're connected. So a really quick and easy way to dump the gal. And then we've seen attackers uh, ransom this information. We've seen them use it to feed into other password spray attacks. Really quick and dirty way of getting some basic information about Office 365. And remember, on identity in Office 365 is backed by Azure AD. So this is going to have a lot of useful information, not just users, but also the groups they're in. You can get their phone numbers if that's being synced. A lot of really useful information. Our second means of alternative access is OAuth abuse. So we already talked a lot about how in Office 365, access to individual components is done using OAuth access tokens. And all of these cloud providers, Office 365 included, gives third-party developers the ability to create applications that can then access the user's data on their behalf and do something cool with it. And you know, if you're thinking about this, well, these are applications that are on a server somewhere. They're running 24-7. They're accessing user's data. It's impossible to enforce multi-factor for that, right? These are server applications, so they don't need multi-factor authentication. And also, these OAuth access tokens are generally valid for about 90 days. So how abuse might work is an attacker is going to create a third-party application. They'll call it maybe an email security scanner. And then they're going to need to fish victims. And they're going to say, hey, uh, you know, corporate policy dictates that you need to install this email security scanner. Uh, please do so now. And the victim user is going to click what's called a consent link. And that consent link takes them to an official Microsoft Office 365 portal, just login.live.com. And it asks them to consent to this application. It says, hey, the uh, email security scanner, it needs to access your mailbox at all times. Uh, please allow this or don't. The victim obviously is going to allow it because they're, you know, they're interested in security. They want their mail to be scanned. Uh, and then the attacker immediately is going to receive an OAuth access token, which they can then use to access the user's data on their behalf at any time. And the unified audit log is going to record a couple of events that, as investigators and defenders, we want to be aware of. But um, there's a little bit of, of nuance to these events. The first is that we can see the operation type here. Let's see if the zoom works. It's kind of typoed. It says, oh, it says add service with no space, then principal and a period. So there's not much standards to these operation types. Some of them are complete sentences. Some of them are like that one word smashed together that we saw with ADFS. Just something to be aware of. Like You really need to look up these operation types before you search them so you know that you're getting the data you expect. And then in the extended parameters attribute is really where the important information is for OAuth abuse. We have this address parameter, which is escaped for us for some reason. But we have this full URL. And this URL is actually the URL that the attacker owns that is receiving the OAuth access tokens. So this is our malicious indicator. This is what we know the attacker owns. This is where their application lives, or at least where the portion that receives OAuth tokens live. So as investigators and defenders, you know, this is an IP address that we're going to want to search on. We're going to want to you know, give to our Intel team, maybe. And importantly, when we're auditing these type of actions, it's really the only useful piece of information we have with OAuth abuse. You'll get the application name. You'll get its scopes, so the data it's accessing, like Exchange Online. And then you'll get what's called the redirect URI, or where the tokens are being sent. And that's really all you get. So it's kind of, it's kind of a challenge to identify what's a malicious OAuth app and what's not unless you have some like, knowledge of the tenant and what applications your admins actually need. But something to be aware of and, and something that we've seen uh, some people try and leverage. 
So lastly, moving on to the new logging features that I've kind of been teasing that Microsoft is releasing. I'm excited to talk about these. There is some, some really cool stuff that's coming out, and we kind of are going to get a little bit of an advanced taste here. Um, so we talked about at the top of the talk that currently there's no good way to tell your management team, you know, these are the messages that an attacker viewed in a mailbox. There's just no way, because if we look here at our um, audit matrix for the mailbox audit log, we can see that for owner access, the messages that are being read, is not, they're not recorded. Microsoft knows that this was a really big challenge to us as investigators, and they actually, in the first half of 2019, are adding mail read auditing for owner access. So now our matrix looks like this, which is really helpful to us as investigators. So this data lives in the mailbox audit log, which means it's going to be audited per mailbox. It's going to follow the same rules as the mailbox audit log, so 90-day retention period, and it's going to count against your mailbox quota storage. Um, Microsoft Office 365 gives you 100 gigabytes by default. Your tenant admins may have changed that, but it, it really shouldn't take up that much data. Um, the guys I was talking to said maybe it'll take up five gigabytes of your quota. Um, so really not to be, a lot to be concerned about with. And again, this is a super important feature. Really wouldn't turn it off. So how exactly is it going to work? There's a new operation being added to the mailbox audit log called mail items access. And every two minutes, it's going to aggregate all the internet message IDs, so the unique ID of a message, and it's going to store it in this mail items access operation. And the Microsoft guys took extra pains to make sure that any sort of simultaneous or unauthorized access to a mailbox would generate new mail item access events so that as investigators, as defenders, we'll be able to definitively say these messages are read by our legitimate user and these messages were read by the attacker. So things like a new client IP address, a new user agent string, these will all generate new mail item access events. The only real gotcha with this is there is a deduping effort. So because these events are being aggregated every two minutes, you know, you, there may be a case where a user clicks on one message many times. And what's going to happen is if a message is viewed more than once within the same session, over an hour period, it's only going to be audited once. So that's just something to be aware of. What exactly is going to be recorded? It's going to cover access to a mailbox using modern authentication and those legacy authentication protocols. It covers messages accessed with OWA. And if you have a thread of messages, it's only going to record the individual message that was actually opened. So pretty good level of granularity there. It's also going to record messages that were accessed. So if you access a message using the PowerShell APIs, the CLI or the EWS, it will record those as well. And it's also really helpfully going to record sync events. So when you use a mobile client to access Office 365 Exchange Online, it does like a limited sync. I think it's 14 days or a month by default. So that will enable us, that will enable the log to audit the individual message IDs that were synced. If the attacker is using a thick client like Outlook for Desktop, that's a much larger sync. I think it's a year by default. So we're not going to be able to, it's not going to be able to record every single message ID, but it will at least tell you when a sync occurred. So you can kind of use that as a cutoff date in your investigations. The last feature that we're adding is Exchange Online, that they're adding, excuse me, is Exchange Online Sessioning. So previously, you know, if an attacker is using Tor or a VPN, for example, their IP address is going to change several hundred times over the course of their intrusion. And uh, previously, it was really difficult to correlate those disparate events from different IP addresses into a single attacker session. You were kind of reliant on the user agent string, which is flimsy at best. Now the mailbox audit log is going to be recording session IDs. So it's going to actually tell you what, which events are tied to which sessions. So you can really aggregate all, your, all of your events into a single or multiple attacker sessions and tell exactly what happened, what the attacker did. It's just important to know that this is only applicable to modern authentication because it's using some OAuth mechanics on the back end. So if the attacker is using legacy auth, you're, you're going to be out of luck there. Um, that kind of brings us to the end. So what did we learn? Hopefully we learned a lot about Office 365 and its uh, intricacies. Um, there's a lot of different, different auditing options. Microsoft is taking some steps to enable them by default, but they've been a little slow on rolling it out. You know, they have a lot of tenants, so I wouldn't rely on them to do it for you. You should do it yourselves. And we really recommend when we come into an investigation that organizations start sending these logs to a SIM. The reasons are you know, pretty obvious that you have the 90-day limitation. You also have these PowerShell clunkiness that I've kind of just given some examples of. If you're sending these logs to a SIM, you don't have to worry about that. You, know, you can use your Splunk. You can use the query language that you're comfortable with. And you can also obviously correlate it against all your other data that you're hopefully sending there. Uh, there are additional licensing options, which means you get more information from Microsoft. Um, 
E3 license is the most common one we see, but if you upgrade to E5, you get things like cloud app security, threat intelligence, some really useful features that I would definitely recommend you look at. And you can license based on individual users, right? So maybe you only spend the extra money on those execs or those people handling PII. Authentication is kind of complex. It's not as straightforward as you would think. We have legacy authentication that's enabled by default and it doesn't support MFA. That really should be turned off. And the event records that are being audited for different types of access, they can be sent to different logs. We need to understand that. We also need to understand the, some of the limitations with these events. And lastly, attackers are becoming Office 365 experts. Hopefully some of these TTPs have shown you that you know, they're not accessing it in a naive way. They're not just opening up Outlook and kind of searching through. They are reading the documentation. They are becoming very familiar with Office 365. And as defenders, you know, just like we learn a lot about Active Directory on-premise, we learn a lot about malware, we need to be aware of Office 365. I think like at least two-thirds of you guys raised your hand that you use it. We need to be reading those documentation. We need to learn about the auditing. Um, we need to learn about these different things because Microsoft, is, they, they change things pretty quickly and it's, it's something important to be uh, up to date on. <coughs> Uh, so that's all I had. Are there any questions? Yeah. So how many of these artifacts can be found on the web for having to be modules for Office 365? So the question was how many of these artifacts are found on disk versus in Office 365? Uh, the answer is none of them are found on disk. They're all in Office 365. So they're all in the unified audit log or the mailbox audit log. And as it stands right now, all auditing options are off by default in Office 365. You need to enable them. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, have you looked at Power BI, um, so like their logging and like the access to the SQL databases that might be private otherwise? So the question was, have you looked into Power BI and how access into the databases and that kind of thing would work? Um, I haven't looked at it too much. Um, there's just so many applications there. Um, but my on the back end, a lot of these uh, applications use OneDrive for file storage. So I actually just found out the other day, although it makes sense that when you use, if you use Microsoft Teams and you like share a file with a colleague, it actually just uploads it to OneDrive and then gives them a OneDrive link, which kind of was really annoying for me. I like don't want all this data in OneDrive, but there it is. Um, so my guess is might use something similar to that, but no, that's a good question. It's something to look into. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, they're, they're aware of these issues and, and we have a really, you know, I like to think a good relationship with them and, and we talk to them pretty frequently and, you know, there's all the community portals. They're definitely aware of them. It's just, I think it's probably like a big engineering problem for them and, you know, maybe if someone works at Microsoft and they're in the audience, they can talk to you about it. But, you know, I've seen there's a lot of different teams running these things, right? And, and just like any organization, it's, it's, it's slow moving. But they're definitely aware of it and, you know, this changes to the mailbox audit log, you know, they know that where our requests are and they know what we need to, what we want to see as investigators. Yep. Anything else? Yep. Um, so the question was, are there any security features that Microsoft has enabled that you wouldn't get if you're federated? Um, off the top of my head, I would say, no, though it does actually add more complexity when you have federated off. So uh, conditional access policies, which I talked about here, they live in Office 365 world, so they happen in Azure. And with ADFS or federated off, you get a whole other sort of settings called client access policies. So it's basically just another layer where you can implement controls. But as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that you would miss out on. Uh, yeah, we're still in the front. Oh. Is there, have you encountered a, a, an effective way to manage replications as the OAuth variable? Um, that's actually interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I know there's a PowerShell command that you can run to re manually revoke access, uh, manually revoke tokens. Um, and that would be, my guess, is the best way to do it. Um, yeah. That's a good question. So oh, the question was, uh, when you do ADFS, you may lose the ability to re revoke OAuth tokens. What's the best way to take care of that? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah, so I actually meant to mention this. I, I gave a talk on OAuth abuse and MFA abuse at DerbyCon this year. 
and there's a lot of good information in there. But essentially, if you want to turn off these third-party applications, um, if you have like E3 licenses, your options are really turn it off completely or do nothing. Um, if you have uh, cloud app security, which is the advanced feature, you can do a little bit more fine-tuning. Um, and you know, I just want to caveat in general, right? Like I like to think I'm pretty well aware of Office 365, and I have a lot of exposure to it. But I, I don't work for Microsoft, so you know, take some of this with a grain of salt. But uh, so far, I haven't lied to you, I promise. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so an OAuth access token has a lifetime of one hour by default, and it needs to be refreshed every hour. Um, if you select like keep me signed in or offline access, uh, it can last for I think it's 90 days before you need to re-enter your creds. Uh, There's a question in the. Yeah, I was just Yeah, so. But I do know when you get on Microsoft side, it's big tech impossible to stop that kind of thing. Yep. It will expire in any way before it's another end of the day. Is there a way to find that in the logic center when that's happening? Outside of having Azure AD P2, which does the risky sign on stuff? Yeah, so the question was how can you see some of the, the risky sign ons with uh, OAuth tokens and impossible travel? I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. Anything else? Yeah, in the front. But just this point on the longevity of the old token, and if I'm asking something already covered, I apologize, I'll go back to the next point. Sure. But um, my understanding is that there is a feature on the edge side to do source IP limiting on some of the transactions with Office 365, right. uh, including getting the old token. Yes. Um, what issues have you seen with that configuration around you know, what can be done outside of that source IP once you've got the old token and how you can restrict that? So I think the question was, you can use conditional access policies to limit authentication to Office 365 based on source IP. Um, but is there anything else you can do after that? Is that the question? Well, I mean, I don't know the particular UI for configuring that. Yeah. I know there's some broken aspects of it. Um, have you looked at that at all? Um, I mean, the conditional access policies are, are kind of complex, but I haven't seen any issues with implementing them. It's just. The, the basic premise is that once you get an OAuth access token, it's good. You can use it to access Office 365. It's, it's as good as gold, and there's no real restrictions placed on it once you have the token. Okay. Yeah? So you mentioned with PWS, there's going to be some logic capabilities where you can pull the message and read uh, information. Yeah. Yeah, so those are all going to use, I think MacMail, especially in Thunderbird, they still use IMAP and POP. So how will message reads be uh, recorded that way? I think, so they'll, they'll definitely be recorded because Microsoft is going to cover legacy off and modern off. So they'll be in the mailbox audit log. Um, so I, I don't think there'll be any issue with that. I, I think it probably depends on what your mail client is using. So some mail clients use EWS. Some of them just use POP, IMAP. Um, so like the, the client, I guess, that's gets recorded may differ, but they should all be recorded no matter, no matter how it's being accessed. Okay, um, so that's all the time we have. I'm going to actually have a flight to catch, but I'll stick around for like five minutes or so if you guys have anything to ask me. Um, yeah, thank you for your time.